Right. So here we go. We're going to start with a really fast, high-level summary of what we call supervised machine learning. That's when we say machine learning, that's almost always what people do and what almost always what they mean when they say supervised or machine learning. Okay. Uh, and then once we go through that, we'll talk more specifically about deep learning regressors and classifiers. All right. The goal of machine learning is to come up with some kind of a model that given a particular instance or record, an entity, information about that entity, we want to make a prediction, whether this is a, uh, you know, like a, well, you can say prediction or a regression. So in this particular case, I'm showing somebody's credit record, how many credit cards they have, do they pay on time? That yields a numeric credit score, whether that's, uh, you know, in any particular range is up to you, okay? The opposite side of the house is a classifier. And we're once again taking in information about a particular record or an entity, this down a little bit. <clears throat> but instead of yielding a numeric result, we're going to be yielding a category or class. So it, I could look at the pixels of an image and say it's a car, it's a yield sign, a stop sign, it could be whatever, it's a cat, a dog, it's a llama, whatever. And as before, the features going in, the characteristics of this entity are numeric values. In this particular case, they are the numeric values that represent the pixels of an image all laid out in a nice line as a feature vector. Now, at first glance, you'll look at regression and classification and you'll say, oh, these are two different things. But it turns out they're really just two sides of the same coin when it comes to implementation. As you'll see, uh, particularly in deep learning, often all we have to do is stick a sigmoid on the end of our neural network, and all of a sudden we have a classifier. We've converted a, a regressor to a classifier. So the way I think of the difference between these two is a regressor draws a line through the data, and a classifier draws lines that are decision boundaries. In this particular case, I have a, a three class problem where I've created a decision surface or boundary that uh, separates these things. So that's really just uh, what we mean when we say a regressor versus a classifier. All right, so in the abstract, what are we doing? All I'm trying to do is look at some training data so here I have a matrix where each row represents the characteristics of a particular entity. And that's mapped to some kind of value, whether this is a numeric value like credit score or salary, it doesn't matter. It could be a classification, in which case it'd be some numeric value, uh, an integer value like a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, so I'm trying to capture the relationship between this set of data and this set of data. So this is mapping to this, this maps to this, and so on. So uh, a bit of terminology, we call this, a, at least in, in my world, I call it a, a feature vector. You can think of it as a set of variables and characteristics, whatever you like. Um, and the target is really just what we're trying to map. That's the target of our mapping. So we want to capture this relationship. You have defined a set of instances of an underlying representation. Uh, distribution mapped to another distribution, but you give me some samples and I'm gonna build a model that represents that and hopefully captures an appropriate relationship. So at least for what we're concerned with in this class, our models are composed of parameters. So our predictions are simply going to be a computation based on these parameters. So you know what a linear regression model looks like. That's what I'm talking about with the parameters, those are your data. Now models can also have architecture, particularly in deep learning. So we talk about layers. So I might have multiple layers. I, multi I might have multiple neurons within each layer. I might choose different nonlinearities. There's lots of things that I can mix and match and put together like Legos to create a neural network. And this is the so-called architecture of this. The values that govern the structure of my architecture are often called hyperparameters. These are like meta parameters, but they're very commonly used. Uh, uh, that word is commonly used to describe other things that we use in training as well, particularly the, la the learning rate or how much regularization am I going to use while I'm doing training, things like that. So, a critical difference between a parameter and a hyperparameter is that the parameters are those things that are learned by the model from the data. 
whereas hyperparameters are specified by us as the programmers. And these are things that we use to tune the model. And I might as well tell you the, the uh, sort of the unpleasant news right up front. Deep learning, I was shocked at how much it was affected by how well we learned to train these things. Um, so in other words, the learning rate you choose and some of these other hyperparameters dramatically affects how good of a model you get out of this, even for the same architecture. And so coming from my world of deterministic programming, where I can use the debugger to tell me exactly what's going on. That was quite a shock to me. But anyway, so all the books that I've read uh, and papers seem to indicate that you can give general guidelines, but there is no magic formula for choosing learning rates and all this kind of stuff. You just have to get a feel for it and you're going to get better and better at it. So that, that's the, on the flip side, uh, trans, that's the, that's the beauty of it, the art of it. You get better, you can get paid better, get a better yeah. job, you know, Thanks. there is some oh, money, money, money. to learn here, you know, the better you get at it, the better okay. job you get. Exactly. And so that's why experience, that's what I was saying, you know, there's a lot more experience. It really, really matters. Uh, well, in general, but also in, uh, particularly in uh, deep learning, because you have to get a feel for what works better for training a model. Okay. So, Speaking of which, what does it mean to train a model? Well, all we're really doing, so remember we have parameters, right? And you can think of them as the betas of a linear regression model for now. All we're trying to do is find parameters, betas, that are you know, optimal or good enough, at least for our needs, as measured by some cost function, which we usually call the loss function. And this loss function is just comparing the known values we want with the predictions from the model, comparing those two and saying, hey, how good are we? What is the quality of my fit? Of how well have I captured that relationship? And so um, the loss function is something in n-dimensional space here. And I'm moving parameters around, trying to find the optimal spot. I'm just trying to find the minimum of that loss function. And the parameters associated with that are the things that are, give, that are going to give me my best model. Now, some important terms you've probably heard before. Um, we say that a model is underfit or it's biased if that model's unable to capture the relationship in this data that's been presented to us. Now, there might be no relationship. It could be completely noise. But, for example, if I have a very complicated sinusoid and my model is simply predicting the average, well, that's a perfectly acceptable model. It's just bias. It's just systematically giving you an incorrect answer. Now, the opposite can also happen. We can be overfit. If we fixate on the vagaries and irrelevant fluctuations in the training data, and we, we fit this really complicated curve through something that is really just a graceful, you know, uh, exponential decay or something like that, then we say we've overfit because we're fitting to things that are not useful for making predictions on data that's not in the training set. Okay, so what we want is for these models to generalize. If a model is overfit, we say it is not general. To be general means that we're gonna get accurate predictions for model or for records that were not used to train the model. Okay, so imagine you go into San Francisco and you look at a whole bunch of apartments to get a model in your head about how much does it cost in rent for an apartment. And now you're gonna see another apartment that you've never seen before and make a prediction about its rent. That's what we care about. And if you can do that well, we would say you have a general model. Okay, a little bit of terminology, just because uh, uh, I'll be kind of using these terms as we go forward. This will be more important uh, in the machine learning course where we go into more detail, but there's, there's two separate things. There's a loss function and a metric. The loss function is really what we use to train the model. So if we can minimize, if we can find the parameters that minimize this loss function, those parameters are the model parameters we want to use. Now, metric is really sort of from a more businessy point of view. Like, what is the outcome I desire? Like, I want something to be accurate. Well, what does that mean? Well, I might, I might use um, mean squared error, or I might use mean absolute value. 
And if it's a classification, it might just measure how many did I get right? But in general, particularly for classification, misclassification rate, like how many did I get right, is, is really, really coarse. And I need instead, uh, and it's, it's often discontinuous, what I need is a very smooth function that I can use to kind of gradually walk down into this valley and find the minimum of my loss function. So you'll see that loss functions tend to be, uh, they tend to have really nice derivatives, they tend to be smooth, and they give me a lot of information about how good my model is beyond the, the information that you would need from a metric, from a business point of view. Okay, um, when we're applying these quality measures to something other than the training set, such as what we'll see in a second, uh, a validation or a test set, that is what's going to inform us about the generality of our model. If we look at a metric that indicates how well our model predicts the training set, well, that doesn't always tell us that much. It's kind of like if I show you an apartment and I say, this is $2,100 a month. And then I give you the same apartment and I say, how much is that? Well, it doesn't take a genius to say $2,100 a month. So it's not as useful to us. Okay, so we typically talk about three important, um, yeah, please, if you have a question, uh, ask. Uh, I think there's enough uh, room in the air. You can, you can just stay out loud. Go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? Sure. Uh, so for, for instance, um, if the metric is not uh, differentiable, let's say if we're doing a, a multi-class classification, what would be a good loss function for, for this? Ah. Uh, we're going to be using a cross entropy loss function that's effective for a K class. You know, do we still call that cross entropy or do we call it uh, negative log loss in that case? What do we, I think I, I always see those terms. All, of, all of the, unless, it, the only thing you don't want to call it is binary because it's not binary, but everything else is the same thing. Log loss, like cross entropy, like, yep. yeah. Okay. Uh, what, what, if, what if the class is uh, unbalanced? Uh, that's a separate question, and uh, let's talk about that in uh, machine learning. <laughs> um, okay, so we generally are given just a pile of data. And so one of the most common things we do at the beginning is to break up this large chunk of data that we get and convert it into three sets, the largest of which is so-called training set. And that's what we're going to use to uh, consume when we're training the model. Validation is like a test set. It is used to evaluate the quality of the model we've just created, but using records that were not used in the actual computation of the betas or whatever your model parameters are. And then finally, there is a so-called test set. And this is something that you create at the beginning. You carve off a chunk of it, and then you lock it away, and you never look at it. You never run it through your model until you think you've gotten exactly the model you want. You've tuned it using the training and validation set. You think you have your model, and then you run that test set through your model, and you use a metric to indicate how well you've done. And that is the only objective measure of generality, because your model has never seen it. Your human mind hasn't seen it. There's no way it is overfit to that particular test set because it hasn't seen it. Okay, so often in common speech, you'll hear me and other people say validation and test set, uh, but know that technically they're separate. And to be a really good data scientist, you want to know the distinction between these things. So this is what we use to compute the parameters. This is how we decide whether we've done a good job. And then this is our final measure to give us a, a, a prognostication, a view of the future about how well this will work in production. Now, right before we go to production, we can recombine all those sets into one big data set and we can retrain the model because we'll talk about this in the machine learning course. One way to uh, so-called regularize, one way to reduce overfitting is to actually have more data, right? If you look at three apartments in San Francisco, your model is very much overfit to those three records. But if I ask you to look at 3,000 records, having more data gives you a better and more general model. And so we would say 
that's a good way to uh, reduce overfitting. Okay. Um, I have a quick question yeah. about loss function. So the hyperparameters are something that are defined in the loss function? That define what? They're defined in the loss function? No, hyperparameters are things like, how deep is my network? How many neurons are in this layer? How fast am I training? Those are the hyperparameters. The parameters are the betas in your linear regression models. And the loss function is something that is looking at, let's see, did I pass that up? Ah, the loss function is simply looking at what you're predicting and comparing it to what it's supposed to be. Possibly to include some of the internal guts of the model, because sometimes we want to constrain the model in regularization so that the model parameters, the betas can't get too big. Okay, so the loss function is at least a function of what you're predicting and what it should be. Um, is it so those are the Y's and the Y hats. Gotcha. Is it something similar to the residuals and linear regression, something like that? Uh, yeah, if you square the residues, right, um, you're gonna get basically mean squared error. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Another question, somebody? Okay, cool. All right, so uh, a quick note about preparing data for machine learning models. So you can't have any strings. Everything has to be numeric. You can't have any categoricals. You've got to convert those, at least for these particular kinds of models that we're going to be doing, you have to encode them as dummy variables, which you're familiar with from linear regression. The other important thing is you can't have any missing values. So you have to conjure up values for those particular uh, empty spots. And there are, that's a subject of our uh, machine learning course, which we'll talk about. Okay, the other thing that we tend to do is we're, try we're trying to make it, remember how I said that at least in my opinion, it's really hard to train a model and that's how people get the big bucks. And if you're really good at training models, um, let's make the job of the training system as easy as possible. And one of the ways to do that is to normalize your variables. And I'm pretty sure you talked about this in linear regression, but all it means is we're gonna zero mean, we're gonna subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviation of the, uh, the variance. So we, we want this to be um, all of the distributions to look the same. So look what happens when I do that. So first let's look at what happens to the data after I've normalized it on the right hand side here. You can see that I've got a bunch of data points from the car data set. It's the weight of the car versus how many miles per gallon. So this is a very boring vector of one value mapped to another value. But if I normalize it, notice the shape doesn't change. All I've done is shifted it and squished it. But if, if I stretch the range out, then it looks exactly the same, right? Obviously it's squished if I use it on the same scale, but I'm relative to each other, they're the same shape if you want to think of it that way. But when I've done that, look what happens to my loss function. So this is, if, uh, if you're okay looking at a sort of a heat map, a topographical map, the red areas are the highest loss or cost area, and the blue is the shallow valley here. And what happens is, um, if you're in a particular valley, you can look at it like a big taco. Oh, now I'm thinking about Taco Bell. But uh, so you have a big valley, and it's the vectors pointing at the minimum are very different depending on which direction you're looking. Whereas here, everything looks like this nice bowl. And if you drop a marble in the bowl, it'll go wee and it'll roll right down to the bottom here. Okay, so in the end, there's, there's a huge amount of discussion about this on the web, about why exactly it does do this. But the fact is empirically, it really improves the speed of your training and you can find a better solution. Okay, so that's one of the things that you will do in preparation. 